Well, good morning, folks. I see this side of the room has it again. So I apologize over here because I'm probably predominantly going to be facing that direction. Take your Bibles and open them to the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. We've been in this study for a couple of weeks now, and we're still working our way through the first chapter, though hopefully we're going to finish it up today. Chapter 1 of this book, it really functions as an introduction to the investigation the Lord's bringing to our attention. I mentioned um, Ecclesiastes reads very much like a sermon as you go through it. And so the first chapter is that introduction. Last week we watched as the king in Jerusalem began to answer the big question that was posed back in chapter 1 and verse 3, which is what profit is there in this world? Solomon dealt with four different areas of life to illustrate the character of God and also highlight God's design and purpose in this world. Those were family, the environment, personal investments, and legacy. We learned that each of these things, once they're detached from spiritual truth, really are nothing but useless vanity. This morning, our introduction shifts to a different but very closely related subject, because in verses 12 through 18, we encounter a short exposition on wisdom, Not just what wisdom is, but how it may be used, and what the results of that exercise might be. Again, under the sun is the primary context. We're looking at that kind of wisdom that is exercised without any connection to spiritual truth. Now, I think we could make a pretty good argument, a biblical argument, that earthly wisdom is not real wisdom at all. Verses like Proverbs 1-7 confirm this by telling us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. But yet, there is such a thing as wisdom here under the sun, isn't there? Human wisdom. And in this text, Solomon will begin to examine whether it has any value or usefulness at all. Though we can predict the results of his study before even reading it, these verses still provide a good lesson on the proper use of wisdom for us. So let's start by reading the passage together. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. I communed with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge, and I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. All right, let's go through this text in order. Verse 12, which we touched on already in previous studies, acts as a brief introduction to this section. It divides verses 13 through 18 from the ones that came before them. Now, it's not entirely a different subject, but we do get some new content here. Solomon is looking at the same subject, but from a different perspective. He's going to keep doing this as we go through the book, by the way. Always the same theme and primary topic, but looking at it from a whole bunch of different vantage points. Verse 12 reminds us of the human writer of this book. It gives us his day job, as it were. He was the king. But it also mentions his spiritual vocation in the same sentence. He was a king, but he was much more notably an excellent preacher. Now, we won't go into it because we've already discussed this, but you should remember everything that's included in verse 12, what it means to be a preacher, one that can declare God's word effectively. You should also remember some of the history behind Solomon's kingship and his rise to power. God placed him in a unique position to be the one to write this book. Next, verse 13 gives the audience some critical information on the motivation for Ecclesiastes. If you're trying to identify key verses as you take notes throughout this study, this is one you definitely should be aware of. It tells us that the king gave his heart 
to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. And that's what the entire book of Ecclesiastes is about. That is an excellent summary of what Solomon is doing. You'll notice that he's using his abilities for a noble purpose. Remember, this wisdom was given to him by God. It was supernatural. It exceeded the wisdom of all other men. And what is the king doing with the gift God has given? Well, he's using his understanding to examine this world very carefully. He's looking at works and the characteristics of human wisdom. And the first thing that we can see about the appropriate use of wisdom relates to the meaning of life. We see that, number one, Solomon used wisdom to investigate reality. He was wise enough to know that if he was really going to get to the heart of the human condition, for our benefit, he was going to have to purposely limit his view to those things done under heaven, as the scripture says. And you'll notice a couple of clues about his methodology, methodology that are emphasized here. First, it says that Solomon gave his heart to the task before him. That word heart is the Hebrew leib, and it refers to the inner man, the place of knowledge, thinking, and reflection. The king was willing to devote his mind and his intellect wholly to the task. He was fully committed to his investigation. True wisdom is characteristically an orderly and thoughtful thing. We see evidence of that right from the beginning of verse 13. The preacher gave his heart to the work. Solomon is going to carry on an examination of all things done under heaven. And he's going to complete his assignment. And to this point, I would ask, do we have a similar attitude as we exercise the wisdom and the knowledge that God has given to us? You know, the Christian life, and especially ministry in one of the Lord's churches, provides numerous opportunities for us to practice this very thing. If you are walking closely with the Lord and serving in a sound church, then you are going to encounter many situations that will far exceed your level of wisdom and knowledge. Personally, I can't even keep track of the number of times that I have been challenged about my need to grow in a particular area or to gain more biblical understanding about some subject. That's just the reality of spiritual growth. No matter how long you've been saved, you never arrive at a point where you stop growing or should even try to stop growing. And so as we grow and as we learn more, we can become better prepared to handle trials or situations that may have hindered us in the past. And we should maintain a similar attitude to what we see right here. There should be an earnestness and a willingness to apply ourselves and our hearts fully to the task, whatever it is. A sincere desire for truth will always yield this God-honoring result. Solomon really put his heart into the effort. And with God's grace, the result was Ecclesiastes. What a blessing it is to God's people. So we see Solomon's godly attitude here. But then what was the king exploring? Well, if you look carefully at the end of verse 13, you'll see this little phrase, sore travail. It reads, this sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. The beginning of verse 13 provides the main objective of the book, and the end gives us a summary of precisely what Solomon was trying to figure out. Now, when you see that phrase, sore travail, you might think it's talking about some kind of a trial or a tribulation, a difficulty. But that's not what the phrase means. The word sore means, as you might think, something bad or evil. But the word travail, from the Hebrew inyan, it doesn't mean a trial. It means a business or a task. So Solomon is telling us that God has given all mankind a job an occupation that is not at all pleasant for us to carry out. The text says the Lord has given this thing that men may be exercised by it. The phrase to be exercised comes from a single three-letter Hebrew word, anah. It means to be busy with something, focused on something, and occupied by something. So the question that's probably in your mind is, what is this evil and unpleasant task that God has given to all men? Well, it's the very thing spoken about at the beginning of the verse. The investigation, the search for meaning in a life lived under the sun. The work that the king is doing is the very business that God has assigned to all mankind. We all understand what he's talking about. 
because all men naturally seek meaning and purpose. doesn't matter who you are or where you live, that's an intrinsic part of how we're made. The search for meaning in this life is something that has drastically affected every person to ever live. Did you know it's the hidden motivation for all world religions, philosophies, and belief systems? It drives economies, governments, and it shapes entire civilizations. Because no matter where you find people and no matter what they're all doing, all men are chasing the same thing, a life of purpose, a life of true value and usefulness. And you see, God's original intent for his creation was that every man and woman on this planet would find their identity in him. There was never supposed to be a situation where a person would have to question what their purpose was or wonder where to find true meaning in life. Prior to the fall, Adam and Eve did not spend any time agonizing over whether their lives really mattered. It wasn't an issue because they were in perfect relationship with God and in perfect harmony with each other. The giant question mark that looms in the heart of every person that's born into this fallen world was not there in the Garden of Eden. When our ancestors sinned, they were immediately separated from God. And a chief consequence of this separation is linked with what Solomon writes about in Ecclesiastes. In sin and in the fall, full security was replaced by a nagging insecurity. Peace was replaced by unrest. Contentment overwhelmed by anxiety. The settled reality of God's good purpose for his creation gave way to an agonizing search for meaning and for fulfillment. And it is this search and the efforts that go along with it that Solomon is trying to bring to our attention. Folks, it doesn't matter who you are or your life experiences. All of us need to be brought face to face with a harsh reality. Outside of Christ, outside of true fellowship with God, the one that made us, we will never experience true meaning. That gnawing question, that search for answers, it will continue to torment all men, every man, until the moment that they die. So what the preacher does in Ecclesiastes is he introduces us to all of the things that men try to do to cope with this one foundational issue. Men deceive themselves into thinking that the very business that God has cursed them with will somehow bring them value, meaning, or purpose. They throw themselves into every endeavor, forgetting the search itself is ordained by God to be an unpleasant and ultimately an unsatisfying thing. This life is truly a sore travail because God intends that a man would just give up, abandon his vanity, and instead find refuge in him, the only source of true peace, contentment, or purpose. And so in verse 13, we have King Solomon devoting his heart and applying his great wisdom to this issue for God's glory and for our edification. Again, he's restricting his view to that which purposely excludes the spiritual. So as we consider the proper exercise of wisdom and the question of whether human wisdom has any lasting value, we must understand that even the wisest man in the world if his vision never rises above the sun, is subject to the same vain efforts, the same sore travail as everyone else. But Solomon didn't do this. Instead, he used his great wisdom to expose the truth. Now, following verse 13, the next thing we find in this passage is that the preacher gave his heart to evaluate all the activities that a man might invest himself in. Our second point is that Solomon used wisdom to judge human works. He judged human works. Verse 14 and 15 tell us, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. Here, the king describes his personal experience and his own observations. He has knowledge about every facet of human life. He has witnessed what men do, and out of this mountain of evidence comes the conclusion that everything we might try to do is ultimately subjected to vanity. The works described here, they're the very th things we spoke about a moment ago. In their never-ending quest for meaning and purpose, men stuff their lives with a multitude of different tasks, diversions, and distractions. You'll notice the key phrase, under the sun, as it appears here. These works 
are all the things men might try to do outside of a relationship with God. If the common business that all men share was identified as sore travail, then the works spoken of here are the individual ways that this search for meaning manifests itself. Like earlier verses, we know all about what Solomon is describing from personal experience. You know it, and I know it too. Though everyone wants the same things, meaning and purpose, people will try to achieve this goal in a variety of different ways. Maybe they try to find fulfillment in a particular career or trade, or in creative expression, things like music, art, or invention. Perhaps religion and its duties and rituals will bring value to this life. What about philanthropy, charity, or caring for the poor? Military service, adventure and travel, entertainment, family and friends, education, romance and relationship. And when men discover that all of these things will eventually crumble and fall apart, the despair, it often seeks or it drives them to seek relief in physical excess, fornication, glutter, gluttony, drugs, alcohol, greed. All of these things are living proof that all men desperately desire something, anything to numb the pain and uncertainty that rages inside their heart. It's this very thing that Solomon has both observed and experienced for himself. He has used his wisdom to judge the works of men and his own works, and he's found all of them to be totally useless. He calls them vanity and vexation of spirit. We'll see that phrase seven times in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's another key concept being communicated by the preacher. You should remember what this word vanity means, something that is temporary or vapor-like. The word vexation is very critical for us to understand. It's translated from the Hebrew word reuth, and it's another of the words that only appears in the book of Ecclesiastes. It means a longing or a striving. Next, the word spirit. This comes from the Hebrew word ruah. It's translated in our Bibles as either spirit of man or the spirit of God 232 times. It's also translated less often as wind or breath. Now, most of the modern versions render these two words into the phrase grasping after the wind. And this, tra this translation choice essentially makes the end of verse 14 redundant. Our Bibles, however, preserve the nuance of meaning that Solomon was trying to communicate. Remember, the context in all of these verses is the internal struggle that all men experience as they try to obtain meaning from a godless life. It shows up in their works, but the real problem is an internal one, a heart condition. The reason that Ecclesiastes is an evangelistic book is because it confronts a life that's separated from God. It provides arguments that any person, regardless of their background, can easily relate to. And it takes all of that strong evidence, forms it into a sharp point, and drives it deep into the heart of any man that's trying to live life on his own. Now, that next verse, verse 15, says something that's very interesting. You read it with me. It says, That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. What does that mean? Well, we just read about a whole slew of different works that men might try in their efforts to find fulfillment. I gave several examples of different vocations or social causes that a person might invest in. Verse 15 is revealing the harsh reality of this world, a reality that remains unchanged despite every effort to the contrary. We live in a fallen and a sinful environment. As a result, Ecclesiastes tells us there will always be brokenness and poverty here. This world is both evil and sadly lacking in many ways. As long as men live in this world, they will experience negative effects like pain, suffering, loneliness, disease, and hunger. These things have been present since the fall, and until the Lord Jesus Christ does away with this wicked place, those things are going to continue. So knowing this, why did Solomon bring it up? Was his audience ignorant of the trials and difficulties that define human life? Are we unaware of them? No, that's not the point. It goes back to what we discussed last week, and we learned from the phrase in verse 10. See, this is new. Remember that? A fundamental part of the works that the preacher is judging relates to the fact that in their search for value, men often think that improving this world is the solution. If only I had a nicer house, then I'd be satisfied. 
If I just had a more fulfilling career, then I could rest. If I could just be elected to a higher office, then I might make a difference. If I could feed more of the hungry, cure more of the sick, prevent more suffering, or raise the minimum wage, perhaps things would be better. We need to make this world a better place. Have you ever heard that kind of thing from the mouth of an activist before? Now, I'm not saying that any of these things are wrong in and of themselves, and in fact, Christians especially should have a high level of, level of concern about other people and the events affecting their lives. But Ecclesiastes, it reminds us that despite every work, this world will ultimately remain unchanged. You can't straighten a bent stick, and you can't count something that just isn't there. So, Mr. Humanitarian, feed the poor, but understand there will always be hunger. Mr. Doctor, care for the ill, but know there will always be sickness and death. Mr. Politician, there will always be injustice in this world. Mr. Promotion, men will always lack something. And Mr. Prosperity, your children, your neighbor's children, will never have enough to be happy. The lesson is clear. No amount of human improvement or renovation can fix this earth. We simply cannot bridge the gap between ourselves and what we are only meant to find in God through our own efforts. We can't do it. The conclusion that Solomon arrives at is inescapable. Without Christ, we have nothing but bent sticks and missing pieces. Solomon uses his God-given wisdom to examine reality and to judge the actions of men. Though he is primarily addressing the lost here, there are some excellent applications for believers as well. If you understand the futility of human work on a personal level, if you understand it biblically, then you are much better prepared to minister to people's actual needs and also address the motivation behind their actions. Did you know we live in a society that believes that if everything about a person's environment is right, they will also be okay? A religious culture where churches try really hard to satisfy what people tell them that they need. People cry, I need this, and churches and social organizations rush to fill that gap. Things like guilt, anxiety, insecurity, and pain, they're all consequences of sin and of separation from God. Hunger, disease, injustice, and poverty, they all arise from the same source as well. When a person or a church is confused about what the real problem is, they will waste an enormous amount of time and resources on solutions that are not really solutions and fixes that don't really fix anything. This strategy completely misses the truth about the human condition, and it ignores Solomon's argument completely, and it never actually addresses the real problem. Because the leaders of our society and the leaders of many assemblies calling themselves churches are not themselves saved, it's no surprise that this is an issue. You can't expect any more from someone that has never experienced life above the sun. They are simply seeking to offer others what they have found helpful for themselves. And some are quite sincere in their efforts, but the Bible says that all these things are still just vanity and vexation of spirit. But we're not like that, you might say. We're not one of those contemporary churches that have compromised in this area. My ministry isn't like that. I get to the real heart of the issue. We need to understand there are countless ways to fall into the same trap. Any time, any time that we trade what the Bible says that men need for what they want, we are making the same mistake. All men, all of them, they want a form of religion. They want relationships. They want dialogue and belonging and satisfaction and purpose and meaning. Please recognize that there is always a real danger of trading what the Bible says about men for what they claim about themselves. An unsafe person is going to give you any number of different reasons for why their life is the way that it is. It's not their fault that they are in such a mess. Something in the environment is just not going their way. And your task as you minister to them is not to be distracted by these claims and peripheral issues. Not because you don't care about them, but because these things are not the real problem. Now this might be a bit direct, but we're not in ministry to small talk with lost people about unspiritual things. We're not in ministry to soothe their need for God with our company. We're not in ministry to make someone that is alienated from Christ 
feel like they belong. You can't win someone to Christ using carnal means, no matter how subtle those methods might be. All of these things, though not sinful, they're not our mission, folks. You, in proclaiming the truth, are to offer people something entirely different than what they think they need. In fact, the gospel, the lordship of Christ, it confronts and it rebukes any attempts to find meaning in something else. Because finding value and meaning in something besides your creator, it's nothing more than idolatry. If we trade this kind of activity for the truth, even something that was not sinful can quickly become so. So, please allow the perspective offered by Ecclesiastes to strengthen and also clarify exactly how you should relate to people. Allow God's sword to deal with the real problem. All right, we're talking about the proper use of wisdom. The next thing we see in this text is the fact the preacher didn't just use wisdom to judge the works of others. He used wisdom to evaluate himself. Solomon's wisdom... Number three, prompted self-reflection. His wisdom prompted self-reflection. Verse 16 says, I communed with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. The investigation now turns inward as Solomon reflects on himself. He tells us that he communed with his own heart. Commune just means to speak. So the preacher is describing that private internal dialogue that all of us experience. Well, at least I do. I hope the rest of you do. He's looking at the value of his own wisdom. And this evaluation identifies three things that Solomon recognized about himself. The first is found in the two words, great estate. They come from the single Hebrew word, gadal, which means to become great or important. It's not just talking about wealth. It's talking about power and influence. Solomon acknowledges that from an earthly perspective, he has an awful lot in his favor. I mean, if value and meaning were to be found in position, surely the king of Israel would have achieved it. The preacher is telling us where he fits into the equation. It's similar to the introduction in the book where we listed some of his special qualifications. Next, the king mentions his personal pursuit of wisdom. God had given to it, it to him, but he also desired it. What he says is not meant as a brag. The fact that he had more wisdom than any king to come before him was just the simple truth, and it was due to God. Solomon had power, wisdom, and finally he tells us that he had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. That word experience literally means sight, personal experience. Solomon had seen human wisdom and ingenuity in action. He had already observed its effect and its value, and so now as a witness, He's able to report on the results from his own life. Essentially, what this verse is telling us is that Solomon's conclusions are trustworthy. He's not approaching the issue from a place of ignorance or detachment. He's actually lived the things that he's talking about. And he lived them from a perspective that none of us will reach. Verse 17 says, And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit. The point here is very clear. Wisdom is only valuable as it provides a contrast against foolishness. These two words, madness and folly, appear four times in the book of Ecclesiastes. Again, madness, the word holela, is only found in this book. It's used as a synonym for folly or foolishness. Solomon, in saying that he gave his heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly, he's talking about having the insight to recognize the difference between the two. Kind of like when Hebrews 5.14 says, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. But there is a difference here. Whereas Hebrews describes discernment that's gained through the study of God's word, Ecclesiastes speaks of only human wisdom and human foolishness. From an earthly perspective, is there a significant difference between these two things, human wisdom and human foolishness? After all, Solomon goes on to say in chapter 2 and verse 16, For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever, seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man as the fool? 
Whether you are wise or foolish, by earthly standards, you are still subjected to the same sore travail as everyone else, the same fruitless pursuit of satisfaction. If everything under the sun is subject to vanity, then the lifelong pursuit of wisdom and even the recognition of that which is foolish, it's still worthless. There's no real contrast between the two. They both end the same way. Solomon writes that the ability to tell the difference between human wisdom and madness and folly, it's nothing more than vexation of spirit. Men desire wisdom and discernment for the same reason that they want to improve their environment. Because the business that God has given to them, the search for the meaning of life, you see, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon addressed every area of human life, physical, intellectual, volitional. You're not going to find satisfaction in the worlds that your mind can create any more than you'll find it with the things that your hands can create. When it comes to your need for relationship with God, there really is nowhere to hide. There is one benefit, if we could call it that, to the use of human wisdom, though. And with verse 18, we'll begin our conclusion for today. It says, for in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. This is actually a reference back to what the preacher said in verse 15. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting, it cannot be numbered. Human wisdom only begin, brings grief, because the more knowledge of your world you have, the more you recognize that no matter what men do, they can't fix the problem. We've all seen this in action the young idealist setting out to change the world. No matter the context, what happens to that youthful optimism? It's quickly clouded by reality. Police recruits thinking they're going to help people and then discovering they can't really help, not in any permanent way, realizing that there will always be crime and there will always be criminals. The more experience that's gained in any area, the more the painful realization dawns, I can't change this world through any human effort. This is why Solomon says that the man that pursues wisdom and knowledge, he will only gather to himself grief and sorrow. And don't forget, we're talking about human wisdom here. Spiritual knowledge, the wisdom of God, does not bring us sorrow. By the way, the fact that you can't change the world through human effort, it also extends to ministry, doesn't it? We've been talking about this a great deal lately, but it's an important reminder there can be a certain kind of misplaced idealism in the work of the Lord as well, an inappropriate or an even sinful level of self-confidence. Ecclesiastes 9.11 says, The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. In David's words to Goliath, All this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So Solomon, examining himself from an earthly perspective, judging his wisdom against both madness and folly, and having experienced the sorrow and the grief of this task, he warns his readers one more time about the vanity and the futility of human wisdom. The only value that it has, or could ever have, is to point the hearts of the lost back to their creator. And once again, though the preacher challenges the unsaved with this fact, there's some worthwhile considerations here for us that are saved as well. Are you using the wisdom and understanding God has given to examine yourself? I fear that many times we kind of get stuck on point two of this message. We're quite good at judging the works of others, and we exercise judgment, absolutely be biblical about it. But if all we do is identify the madness and folly around us, we're missing a big part of the proper use of wisdom. Our text told us that Solomon communed with his own heart. This means that there was some serious internal work going on. He considered his position among others, his gift of wisdom, and his experience in life. We know that he's purposely excluding God's word from this analysis for the purpose of looking at himself like any other man. But we must not exclude God's word or God's perspective when it comes time to commune with our own hearts. Our position, gifts, and experiences must all be weighed against the truth of Scripture. We have a benefit that the man trapped by sore travail doesn't have. We are able, as Hebrew told us, to use the Bible to discern between not only wisdom and folly, but between human wisdom and God's wisdom. That's the missing piece here. 
The only way to escape the cycle of vanity described by Solomon is to stop looking for the meaning of life in the very thing God has ordained to have no meaning. There's a kind of sad irony here because our rebellion against God, often styled as freedom, only brings us into bondage. Imagine the true vanity of a lifetime full of questioning and insecurity. Imagine there being no more value to life than what you could draw from what's around you. What an empty existence that would be. So let's be sure to follow the example of Scripture, because the proper use of wisdom requires that we carefully examine ourselves, our activities, and our motivations against the light of God's Word. And with that, we're at the end of our study for this morning. We've looked at verses 12 through 18 of chapter 1, and we've seen Solomon's earnest desire to communicate the truth. Wisdom should prompt us to investigate the world around us. It should encourage us to pay attention to the activities of others that we might minister to them properly. And finally, it should challenge us to examine ourselves. I pray that you can use each of these reminders in the coming week. Next Sunday, Lord willing, we will be in chapter 2, so please read through that this week. Let's pray.